It's 2019 now, everybody. Welcome to my YouTube channel. It's me, Sun Man Part 2. So I just wanted to share a few thoughts with you as we go into this. I think this is the first weekend of 2019 or it's either the first or second. I'm not good with numbers and dates, you know what I'm saying? But what I have seen over these last few days, you know, I'm, I'm a student of the Vedic literature, of course. I love Vedic knowledge because Vedic knowledge leads to knowledge of Krishna. The word Veda means knowledge. So any form of knowledge you have, no matter what mode it's in, whether it's in the mode of ignorance, whether it's in the mode of passion or in the mode of goodness, as long as there's knowledge and information out there, it can be found in the Vedas or something correlating to it can be found in the Vedas. I like to study African tradition African traditional religions as well. And what I'm starting to see, first of all, a little world history. Today, in the world today, we fight over race. In the world, the ancient world, they fought over religion. So let's say prior to 1492, it wasn't so much racial conflict that you have today, because first of all, the terms for race was invented by Europeans in the 1600s. But prior to that, world war was declared on black, brown, and yellow people. Basically, anybody who has anti-gravity hair structure, a war was declared on them in 1490, circa 1492, maybe 1491. I covered it in another video. His name was Pope Innocentus VIII. Basically, the wrath of the devil just spread out all over the planet like a plague after 1492. As a matter of fact, <clears throat> I went to something at the Schomburg a couple of years ago. And it was actually like white teachers and they were talking about ancient Africa and its relationship to Europeans. And the earliest Europeans to come to Africa saw the people, especially the royalty, as their equals or people who were better than them. And for some reason, this racial doctrine and this white supremacy manipulation came into play. And of course, the white God, when you have a white God, see, OK, so if you have people who are causing trouble, but if they give you the image of God, you can never call them the devil or treat them like the devil because subconsciously, if you fight against them, you're fighting against God. You know? So that's why they gave us the image of God. There's many layers to what happened after 1492. But what I can see is that in African traditional religions, voodoo, um, candomble, the Yoruba system, they have some very, very important similarities to the Vedic school of thought, particularly Bhagavata, the Bhagavata school. Okay, now let's make this clear. I'm not a Hindu. Hinduism is three religions mashed into one. It is the religion of people who worship Vishnu. It is the religion of people who worship Shiva. And it is the religion of people who worship the goddess or Shakti. It's three religions. When we as outsiders look at India, we just see people, we just say they are Hindus. It's not a fair name. The word Hindu is not found in any of the Vedas. People always ask me all the time, am I Hindu? And I, I don't take it to offense. It just shows that, you know, they don't have the fund of knowledge that they should have. So understand that Hindu was a word created by Arabs and it was actually Sindhu describing the people who lived across the Sindhu river that's all it was and they call the people hindu there's really no religion called hinduism but what i see with the african traditional religions is that they have a personal aspect of god and they have an impersonal aspect of god so outsiders with small minds will go to africa and see people worshiping stones or trees or rocks or water or nature or spirits and they would say that these people are backwards but actually a lot of these people were in tune with the impersonal aspect of God. And they also have a personal aspect of God because if you go and look at the Yoruba religion, you have Olodumare and you have Olofi. If I'm not mistaken, Olofi is the aspect of God that interacts with the people and with the demigods or the Orishas. So he is the attainable form of God, like how you have Vishnu, you can communicate with Lord Vishnu, but you would have to know either you can go internal, 
inside and communicate with Vishnu directly, or you can actually approach a physical location. You have to go to the shore of the material world. I have no doubt this universe is filled with water. Ether is a form of water. Oh, ether is water comes from ether so water has a lot of the characteristics of ether and we live inside of an etheric ocean once you get outside of this atmosphere the ocean is called akasha ganga and of course you know that word ganga not from the jamaican smoking weed but we know ganga being mother ganges so the akasha or the etheric ganges is outer space all right that's all water but it's an etheric form of water okay it's not like this water that you drink here Poland springs what it means to be from mine no i don't listen i don't want no strikes against my video or, you know it was just a bottle of water please don't fight my video all right don't 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 just don't just be nice all right all right cool in vedic in the vedic school of thought called sanatan dharma or the eternal way the eternal natural way because you all have your dharma you all have your natural way and you continue to act like that life to life to life with minor changes here and there where you're basically the same person from life to life to life in the bhagavata school now this word bhag okay bhagavan means the possessor of all vaughn opulences right bhagavan possessor of all opulences when you're talking about the supreme personality of godhead the supreme lord you're talking about bhagavan and the school of thought innovators that represent bhagavan is the bhagavata dharma school one of the most famous proponents of the bhagavata dharma school was here 500 years ago by the name of chaitanya mahaprabhu okay so bhagavata dharma is a little different from hinduism in that when you say the word hinduism the first thing that comes to people's minds is the worship of many gods. You think of incense, you think of fruit, and people worshiping Lakshmi, Ganesha. They're worshiping Kartikeya because they want to be warriors. They're worshiping Danvantari because they need help with their health. They're worshiping Cupid because they need help with their genitals. They're worshiping this one and worshiping that one. So that is Hinduism. In Bhagavata Dharma, they are only concerned with worshiping Krishna because all of those demigods, they all represent a different part of the body of Krishna anyway, all from the feet to the head. All of the demigods have a place on the body of Krishna. And just like, you know, people want to worship demigods now, I've mentioned before there's 33, at least 33 million demigods in this universe, and some say 333 million. You can't find time in your life to worship Orisha Oko, and you don't have time to worship Olokun and Aganyu and Chango and, and Eshu and, and just there's so many deities that you would have to appease. You it would be a lifelong process, you know. And I mean some people can do that, but it's not favorable for the way of life we live in today. Maybe thousands of years ago you could involve yourself in demigod worship and it would be much easier to get results. But in today's day and time, let me tell you the truth. If you just worship a cow, if you just worship a cow, your etheric body will be immunized against entering into the hellish planets because all of the demigods are contained in the cow, just like all of the demigods are contained inside of Krishna. So if you worship Krishna or if you worship the cow, you'll still get the benefit from worshiping all these different demigods you see bhagavata dharma is not here to make our life a burdensome hard thing it's actually to relieve your ugra karma or your hard karma so bhagavata dharma just makes things more simple you understand all of these ritualistic and i'm gonna tell you something too right a lot of people are talking about ancient egypt and the pyramids and how they were used to send the soul to different planets that is a form of technology right now, there's a form of technology that could transfer someone to a different abode. And what I find interesting about that is that they are doing the same thing that the Brahmins of India was doing as recently as 500 years ago. They had the nerve to uh, copyright the Hare Krishna mantra 
Back then, some say it was Hare Rama, Hare Rama, 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 Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, 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 Hare Hare. That's how they say the mantra originally went, that the Brahmin, but let me tell you what the Brahmins were doing. Just like the ancient Egyptians, they would use, but the Brahmins would use supernatural powers to transfer people to other planets. You could pay them money and they would give you a mantra or certain fast, but generally it was mantra power, and you could actually either leave your body or take your body with you and go to other planets. This is what the Brahmins used to do, and they used to sell this formula. So they made it into a financial endeavor where you could transfer people from one abode to the other, and Lord Chaitanya basically went against them and said, yo, if you're going to use this powerful mantra and make money off of it, I'm going to give the same mantra, but I'm going to give it so that people can get love of God and go back home to the eternal abode. A boat. So ancient Egypt, they were concerned with making sure that the physical life carries on. It wasn't about the spiritual life, just like with the Brahmins. They were not about the spiritual life. They were endowed with the knowledge of how to send people back home to Godhead, but instead they chose to worship money and send people to other planets. Remember, it doesn't matter if you go to the lowest planet in the material world or the highest planet in the material world. On all of those worlds, birth, death, exist so if you're gonna go to the upper planets and live with the demigods fine but you have to die there too you might not suffer old age or sickness but you will die there eventually you will die and you will have to generally come back to the middle planetary systems which are the earthly planets but that's a story for another day and if you would like to end this process of constant death and rebirth then you have to look for the person who can end it for you so you have a person named krish and nah Nah means to negate or to take away, to end, to put an end to something. Nah, to remove that. Nah, I don't want that, right? And you have Krish, which means repeated birth and death. So when you meet Krishna, either in the form of his holy names or meet him directly, you're meeting a person who has the power to stop the process of death and rebirth. Okay, it's very important. That's why you should chant his name. Um, I was just reading somewhere that, the Sanskrit letters, I, I think there's 50 Sanskrit letters. I'm not sure. But these Sanskrit letters, apparently, if you have the power of subtle vision and you look at a person, you can see that inside a person's body, they have petals like a leaf. And each one of these Sanskrit um, letters actually energizes or charges the petals of the leaf that's inside your body. Some people call them chakras or wheels. But whatever it is about this Sanskrit language, it's very important because it activates something deep within. So that, that way, when you do mantras, when you chant, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. When you chant, Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya, Om Namo. When you chant, Lakshmi Balaji, Lakshmi Balaji, Lakshmi Balaji, Lakshmi Balaji, Lakshmi Balaji, Lakshmi Balaji. All of those letters are actually illuminating your spiritual body. And the idea, what you want to get, you don't want to get a white aura. White aura is for those people who are very pure, but they're not very active. You don't really want to get an orange aura because that indicates that you're moving on the level of passion. Passion is also anxiety and pain. But if you can get a blue aura, a blue aura is a person who's transcended to the material world. However, they are active in the material world for the benefit of the living entities in the material world. Those people have a blue aura and that's why you'll see an icon iconography. You'll see Lord Ram, you'll see Lord Krishna. A lot of times um, Shiva, you'll see them painted as blue because blue represents all inclusiveness. Just like when you look at the sky, the sky contains everything that you know of. You see the earth that you live on is contained in the sky. You get it? So. Anything that's all-inclusive or that represents a state beyond what we understand would be colored blue, represented by blue. The deep blue sea, the deep blue skies. It's the same thing, okay? So, and blue, also some people say that the organic aura of the planet Earth itself is blue, and that's why the sky is blue, because the Earth has an aura. And if you could tap into that aura, it's called organ energy. Like when you have, let's say, a salt lamp. I don't know where you can see that, right? That's a salt lamp, right? Those kick off organ energy or negative ions. Those kind of things you need in your life, you see? But I just really want to point out that 
in the Bhagavata school, in the Bhagavata school, uh, that's why I don't want to say of Hinduism. I want to say of Sanatana Dharma. It's a lot like the African traditional religions in that we believe that God has a personal aspect and an impersonal aspect. When you're dealing with his energies, when you're dealing with light, not talking about the light from the sun, I'm talking about the real light that powers all of these suns. As you know, a lot of these suns are not really um, burning balls of fuel. They're actually, um, it's based on an electrical model. It's very complicated to explain, but a lot of these stars that you see are not really stars at all. They're just, um, they're stars, but the energy that you think they are is not what science has been telling you, all right? And those points of light are receiving their energy from something called the Brahma Jyoti. Brahma Jyoti is Krishna's external energy. It's the light that comes off of his body and it's reflected into the material world through these points, these atomic points called stars, all right? So that's really what it is. The stars are not the source of light. They are also receiving their light from Supreme Personality of God at Sri Krishna. Remember, everything in the universe is an expansion of Krishna's energies. Even in ancient Egypt, they showed you that there was 36 principal energies in this universe. All right? The Vedas say something very similar, and they break it down in specifics. Krishna is the supreme controller of these energies. He does not come under their influence at any time. And when he comes to this material world, he takes on a form that's apparent to our eyes and our senses, but it's not material like our bodies because he's not composed of external energy. He is the internal energy. The material world is his external energy and it's under his control. Again, all right? Same way you have an African traditional religions, you have an impersonal and a personal aspect of God. But then there's another class of people called Maya Vod. And Mayavads think that everything is not real. This chair, this couch is not real. But that's not actually true. These atoms are real. They are ex expansions of Krishna's energy, the atomic structure. It is real. It's just temporary. It's temporary, okay? And most of this is empty space anyway. An atom is mostly empty space. So when you see in my skin, you see in my flesh, you're seeing mostly empty space. The only thing about me that's eternal is the soul within not even my aura not my energetic body the soul within is the only part of me that is eternal it's the only part of you that's eternal all right everything else is temporary but it's real just like when you stick a knife into somebody they feel the pain and when you make love to somebody they feel the pleasure so the mayavadis believe first of all mayavadis are actually atheist covered in the form of religion and you see those buddhist monks out there they are actually atheists. They don't have any belief in a God. They might talk to you about God, but that's not their thing. They don't believe in God. They believe that none of this is real. And I, I, don't, I really don't know what their grounding is, but the Mayavads are different. So you can't just call everybody a Hindu. You, you understand? Because everybody has different beliefs and practices and religions within one religion that the world ignorantly calls Hinduism. What I'm into, Bhagavata Dharma which is Krishna consciousness. For me, Krishna is everything. He is the point to get to. He is the point we came from. And even in the African traditional religious systems, even though they open up in the name of Eshu, they will still remind you that all of this is done for the most high. So everything you see is Krishna. Every This is just the impersonal aspect of Krishna. I can't stay with that. I can't worship this brick wall. There's no reciprocity from the brick wall. I need to love a person because only a person can give me love. Although this brick wall is Krishna's energy, it can't manifest love to me. And he is there. Antaryami, Paramatma, the super soul is there in the center of every atom. But that is Krishna in an inactive form. This is Krishna's inactive form. I am Krishna's active form. I am the soul the part and particle of Krishna, and I'm activating this body forever. How many years I have to use this body to get my mission done? Then, when my mission is done in this life, I will either go back home or I'll, most likely I'm staying in the material world. I just I just feel like I'm going to be here for a long time. But hopefully, if I'm going to be here, I just want to serve the Lord. You know what I'm saying? Life after life after life. I want to wake people up. If I have to remain in the material world, I want to wake people up. You know what I mean? And I'm going to need accommodations to do that. 
both in this life and in future lives, if I have to stay here. But if not, I'll go back home and enjoy according to how the, the creator wants me to enjoy and serve and, and love and live in eternal bliss. But right now I'm here in this temporary world. I have some things to straighten out. So if you want to be a Mayavar, that's cool. But your life, your existence is going to be dry. Again, they are atheists. They don't really believe in God. And everything for them is impersonal. They even thought that Krishna was made of material energy when he came to this material world. After so many countless times of Krishna displaying that he was in full control of the material energy, still the Mayavads believe that Krishna was a product of material nature. And it's, it's just a dry existence, and I, I, I wish them the best, you know what I'm saying? But I don't really want to associate with them. 2019 is, is a funny year. You can see judgment is coming to America. It's not even a question. It's, today, people are supposed to get paid. They're not going to get paid, and they're not going to go to work because they can't afford to go to work. And they're not going to check people properly at the airports. It's about to get real unsafe. But anyway, people, I don't want to concentrate on that negativity. It's 2019. You know, move forward in your life. Leave people behind. That are not doing good for you like if i'm not doing good for anybody feel free to move on you know what i'm saying i don't hold nobody hostage you know what i mean i'm not holding nobody i'm only here this planet to really share knowledge and maybe make some power moves in the future that'll really really help people but man i ain't here to handcuff nobody and i ain't here to be handcuffed so if i'm causing trouble in your life move on don't mess with me and just like if anybody's causing trouble in my life i move on i don't mess with them you know what i'm saying but i want 2019 to be an upward and mobile year and just sit tight because you're going to see the judgment you're going to see all kind of signs and wonders um this guy trump is holding the country hostage right now and i want people to see that you know what i mean see that uh, it's not even about an anti-trump rant he's holding the world hostage i think that's all i have to share for now you know what i mean i just wanted to show that the african traditional religions are more like the vedic system than people care to look at but of course you know we have to be divided by race because i'm in a black body i can't read that indian stuff and the indian people because they're in an indian body they can't study that african stuff this is how people really want it to be you know what i'm saying or the indians want to claim supremacy or they had the first knowledge or the africans want to claim supremacy and they had the first knowledge meanwhile i'm telling y'all everybody got everything from krishna so if you could track down the dates and tell me that kemet is the oldest civilization fine or if you could track down the dates and tell me india is the oldest fine i don't care for me isvara paramakrishna sakchid ananda vigraha or nadir adir govinda sarvakara nakaranam so yo i'm out be blessed all right and as always people are always ask me oh yeah another thing people think i'm a monk or something like that nah i'm a regular dude um i'm starting to suspect that because i've chanted Hare krishna so much i've I've tried to engage in this devotional service. Somehow I've received some permanent benefit from that. And it's like people could see something in me that's beyond normal. And all I can say is, well, it has to be the blue aura. It has to be some portion of the blue aura shining out. You know what I'm saying? Because I'm not pure. I'm not totally dirty either. So it has to be a transcendental aspect that's been added to my life as a result of devotional service. So if you want to unlock your true potential, your spiritual powers, then I would advise you to chant Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Crystals contain memory and your blood is actually a form of liquid crystal. So as you chant Hare Krishna, you put transcendental vibrations into your body. There was other things I wanted to mention, but I'm running short on time. And I just want to wish y'all blessings and peace. All right? One.